Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, a podcast by Filecoin Foundation that explores the intersection of blockchain and the data economy. I'm your host, Aaron Stanley, and today I'm joined by Jonathan Doten, CEO of Equity Lab. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Aaron. So Jonathan has been a longtime friend of the Filecoin ecosystem, and I'm sure most listeners are at least familiar with him or his work with Starling Lab, among other things. But he joins us today to talk about another exciting ecosystem project that he's working on called Equity Lab, which is building governance and integrity tools for artificial intelligence. So Jonathan, it's great to have you here. And it would be great if you could give yourself maybe a quick introduction and give us the TLDR of what you're spending your time on right now. Great. Well, it's been awesome these last couple of years thinking about all the big questions that equity is tackling. And, um, you know, I must say that in in my whole career, I, I've really never seen such a rapid change in the pace of innovation in technology. So it, it's it's an incredible moment and it's, it's a privilege to try to address some of these issues. Um, I feel like a lot of the journey that I've had um, through Web3 is now is essentially like culminating where now so many of the tools that we've built have found a critical moment to engage and um, and we've got solutions we've got great solutions that we can offer um, the most important question at least technically of our time which is how, how do we properly govern uh, artificial intelligence and cryptography undoubtedly is um, the best tool that we have uh, to establish uh, methods for governing AI, uh, finding transparency, and uh, the, the critical ways to make what we call um, equitable AI, which is the ability for people to be compensated fairly and to become stakeholders in, in this really important technology. And um, you know, we, we've seen, I think as, as most of the listeners here you know, can attest to, that um, when power is consolidated with very few companies, um, a lot of abuses can happen, and, and really it's tearing at the fabric of, of what we think of as the real promise of the internet. And so now, as we're entering into this new era, we have so many ways in which we've learned the hard lessons, and we've also spent at least a decade now um, sharpening some really important tools that can be helpful. So... Um, yeah, in, in summary, I just can tell you a little bit about myself. I, I spent time at the Starling Lab for the last five years, uh, working on the application of Web3 and human rights. Uh, my background stretches across business as a serial founder, working in private equity, um, even media and entertainment. And um, now in this capacity as a founder of Equity Lab, um, I'm working hard every day to start to apply all of the great principles that we have from the D-Web community uh, to this enormous task of uh, governing AI. And I think most folks in our ecosystem would know you from your uh, from the Starling Lab affiliation and uh, done some really great work there. But I was hoping you could maybe walk us through how what you're doing with Equity Lab is maybe kind of like a natural outgrowth of what you were doing uh, with Starling and some of your other previous ventures. It seems like... Um, you're like, as you kind of alluded to, uh, you're you're on this kind of decade long trajectory of kind of putting together all the pieces of of uh, of these various technological evolutions. And it seems like Equity Lab is is a kind of a nice culmination of, of what you've been working toward all these years. Yeah, it's um, you know, I I haven't had the most traditional career. I've done a lot of different things over the years and it's hard to look ahead when I was doing these things and say, oh, this is all going to kind of connect and, and it will all make sense. And, and um, you know, Steve Jobs has that great line, it's hard to connect the dots forward. And, and in a sense now, you know, I'm, I'm really able to, to look back and say, you know, so many of the things that we were fighting for that um, were on the horizon have now come to, to pass. And so the responsibility that we have to think about authenticity and integrity with AI well, that came out of years working at Starling. Um, and I'll just share a little bit for those listeners who don't know about Starling. It's a, a lab at Stanford. It's still there and I'm still the chair of the lab. And it focuses on using decentralized tools to advance human rights. Specifically, we were working with historians and lawyers and journalists to see how they could use advanced cryptography to help create authentic records that could withstand the, the trials of things like synthetic media and AI that can really come to dispute the uh, authenticity or the um, the facts 
uh, that they are trying to build their work on. And so, you know, we, we worked on some really iconic case studies, preserving testimony of the survivors of genocide. We have five petabytes worth of storage that um, it was early on the Filecoin network and on IFFS. Um, the thesis there was to help distribute this very vulnerable data set as an encrypted corpus but with the idea that the more people that were holding that critical information, the safer it would be for destruction, from destruction. And second, uh, that the idea of cryptographic proofs that could help prove the authenticity of this information was critical, and especially a decentralized approach that made that type of seal even more powerful in order to stand up to people that might deny the existence of some of these genocides and want to destroy or manipulate this type of content. And so having an original record is critical. Um, we moved on to focus on questions around authenticity and journalism, worked with Reuters to cover the 2020 election. And then we've had um, nearly um, 20 fellows that have come through our program uh, that come from major news organizations, and they're all experimenting with these tools. Um, the work was really meaningful and inspiring as we started to develop new language around how to speak to journalists and help them understand the possibilities of the decentralized web. And then finally, we worked with war crimes prosecutors to help create a chain of evidence um, to establish new standards around admissibility for very vulnerable uh, content, such as um, ephemeral records of war crimes that might come from Telegram or YouTube. And if we could preserve those with cryptography, we could help ensure that they weren't manipulated and that when justice finally needed to draw upon this evidence, that it, it would be admissible and it would be trusted because it was sealed with cryptography and, and properly archived and preserved with further cryptographic proofs. So um, in, in a nutshell, like Starling, it focuses on authenticity of real world content and equity came from a realization that um, we needed to start to think about large scale data governance and who has access to information. How can we start to coordinate large scale storage and large scale compute um, that you know, there were certain innovations that were, we needed to focus on um, beyond our lab at Stanford. It was obvious that um, these things were better suited um, to be dealt with first in enterprise. And so we created Equity Lab to help establish uh, this new business model about how you can basically coordinate and properly govern large scale data and computational tasks. Um, if you think about that, that's basically what AI is, right? It's you gather a ton of data and you do a ton of compute. So um, we were very fortunate that early on in the founding of the company, we were able to, um, our very first project was actually focusing on training an LLM. And that was in May of 2022. And my only question in, in, in founding the company and taking this early bet on training AI as our use case um, was whether or not these LLMs were any good. <laughs> you know, at that point, it wasn't clear, right, Aaron? I mean, who, you know, ChatGPT3 was not that impressive. Um, well, yeah, that, that was still sort of a full six to nine months before the hype wave really hit, right? So you were, you were, it was still sort of a, a thing that existed, but it was still just kind of a, it existed in kind of its own little wonky, nerdy corner of the internet, I guess. It wasn't like a mainstream consumer, you know, uh, technology that was driving, you know, had, had a full hype cycle behind it, essentially. Totally. And, you know, I think any any person who kind of looked at the tools back then saw the promise of them, but also, you know, we needed that big leap, which happened in November with um, GPT 3.5 and um, chat GPT 3.5. And, um, you know, that at that point, we had had a head start, we were focusing on a lot of the issues that were really critical in establishing how you might have verifiable governance, verifiable lineage, these are some of the key things you need for a responsible AI. And um, we spent all of 2023, um, actually deploying uh, a large scale model, which we can talk about to really stress test our tools. And uh, this year, we gone to market and been working with some major companies and um, major uh, government agencies um, to focus on um, inspiring use cases for constructive use of, of AI. So let's dive into the Climate GPT project, which I know is one of the projects that Equity Lab is focusing on. Perhaps it's the most uh, high profile at this point in time. Maybe walk us through what exactly Climate GPT is, and then how does how does this 
project kind of embodify, uh, you know, some of the values that you've been just discussing here? Yeah, well, Climate GPT is really a, a first of its kind model. It's meant to help create a task specific LLM that is focused on the impact of climate change. So we designed it for researchers and policymakers and business leaders so that they can start to test different questions that they had about the impact of climate change and to work across different domains. That's really the, the superpower of these LLMs is that they can take vast amounts of information and they can synthesize them. In this case, the task was, okay, let's work across the areas of the natural sciences, the social sciences, and economics. And if we can ask one question, can we get back not just one answer, kind of like a know-it-all answer? Instead, we wanted to use an LLM to synthesize answers across these different disciplines so you actually get a general summary and then also three domain-specific answers from the natural sciences, the social sciences, and economics. And that is, for us, like meant to be really showcasing the power of a, a new paradigm around um, multidisciplinary research that for when you talk to the climate scientists, they claim is essential for understanding climate change. It, it's it's not just the domain of environmentalists. It's it's actually every everyone has a stake in this. And um, an LLM can do that really well. So yeah, happy to get into all the details and talk to you a lot about the, the process and how we governed it. It's It was a, a, a passion project for most of 2023. Yeah, so let's dive into that then. Let's talk a bit about the tech stack that you're using. I understand that you're using the Hedera blockchain actually for for the Climate GBT, or, or I guess it's a Hedera DLT technically, but uh, same same general idea. Uh, so maybe talk a bit about that, and then talk a bit about how Filecoin IPFS is integrated into this uh, this platform as well. Okay. Well, first of all, let, let's talk a little bit about what Climate GBT is. It's basically a collection of different. AI algorithms that we trained. Um, these models um, include fine-tuned versions of Llama, and this was done back in December, so we took Llama 2, and we brought to it um, a whole series of really highly specialized, high-quality scientific research, tokenized that, and used it to fine-tune the general LLM, which is Llama, into becoming this now specialized climate GPT. Mm. Okay. We then also trained uh, one from the ground up, uh, which was a model of 300 billion tokens, and that was a, a 7 billion parameter model. And, and we used that as, as basically a, you know, an additional model that had a variety of different tests that we did around fine-tuning and um, further, basically, specialization. And, and the idea was, could we create a model that outperformed the mega models, right, the general foundational models, the large, large, large language models, and instead um, you know, have one focused on specializing for high, high quality answers on climate change impact and um, one that was um, tested to ensure that it, it met certain benchmarks around accuracy for um, transmitting climate information around climate change. So that includes things like not amplifying common tropes around mis and disinformation. And we developed with the University of Exeter a whole series of benchmarks around that as well. Okay, so the, so what do you got? You got basically a bunch of models and a bunch of data. And what we used cryptography for was to help create what we call an integrity graph, which is basically a, a way for us to establish exactly how we fine tune the models, how we train the models from the ground up. Each of those steps are cryptographically notarized so that we know what was the data that went in there, what was the governance around it? What was the computation? And um, to speak directly to folks in the Filecoin ecosystem, we also wanted to ensure that we knew where the models were stored and also uh, where uh, the data uh, that trained the models, where that's stored as well. The unique thing about Filecoin is that it gave us, a, as we know, a cryptographic proof that you know, audits every 24 hours um, exactly where the, the proof of space time as to where the stuff is stored. But in addition to that, we held ourselves to a very high standard with this training to ensure that it was green, right? Because nothing would be more ironic than training a very energy intensive model with, let's say, power that was you know, driven by fossil fuels. That, that would be just a, a terrible irony. And so the computation um, for training, the storage, and also the inference, all of that was powered, I'm, I'm very proud to say, 
um, by 100% renewable energy. Um, so specifically on training, it was hydropower, and for storage, solar power, and for inference, wind power. And um, you know, there's something like really special about that. As um, was not easy to accomplish that goal, but now you don't have to take my word for it that we did that. We have these cryptographic proofs that can that can say, yeah, this is exactly where those things happened, how much energy was expended, um, where the data sits, and its sovereignty and its integrity. All of these things now have this independent cryptographic proof. Um, we used Hedera, indeed, to help anchor our cryptographic proofs, but it actually begins with, um, verif we use basically a verified credential scheme to help the, the initial notarization, which is off-chain, um, that has a hash, a signature, a whole schema around that, to form the integrity graph. And then we anchor all of those transactions on um, the Hedera blockchain, which is um, one of the most energy efficient blockchains out there as an independent record of the authenticity of, of what we did. Nice. 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 I love the creativity of that and, and, and stacking some of these different components of the, you know, of the, the decentralized web, the web three ecosystem, descent, like putting together these, these, these Legos, these bricks essentially to create this model. And, and then I'd love to talk, talk a bit about the, just the usability of this. So it's from what I understand you have, the, the model isn't just, it's like, as you mentioned, it's not just kind of like you put in a, you know, put in a question and it spits out an answer, right? But it spits out, there's, there's multiple different types of answers it will give you kind of depending on like what type of user you are. Like if you're an academic, for example, it might give you a different response than if you're just, you know, a, you know, an average person asking a question or whatever. So you've really tailored it to make sure a, that like, not only is the data, uh, uh, it's not like one of these kind of garbage in garbage out type of things, but the data is actually like you know, real and verified before it even goes into the model, but you're also programming it so that it, uh, it, it it's, it's giving the user the information in the context that's like most relevant to that particular user. So maybe, maybe kind of talk us through how that all works in practice. Yeah, Aaron, you nailed it. It's context is, is the critical word. And that's, what's missing sometimes from research is that you're just getting an information that it might be accurate, but you don't have the full context around it. So it's hard to interpret. It's hard to action it. And especially with multidisciplinary work like climate change, um, context is everything um, to understanding the significance of, of how you might understand, let's say, the impact of climate change on, on, in one country. Larger context might understand like, exactly why it's happening and also like what are other contributors um, that mitigating factors that can be put into place. Like Those things need, critically, they need context. Um, I'll speak to you a little bit about uh, the, how this came together because it's, it's, um, it's a really a special collaboration. Um, to his credit, Daniel Erasmus, um, who has been an, an incredible member of the D-Web community. He's likely have seen him at uh, D-Web camp or uh, D-Web summits over the years. Um, you know, this has really been decades of his work in creating this incredible data set, which is really the, the largest, and I would say the last independent scrape of the web. So that he's been out there for years. And Brewster Kale and others have been you know, critical um, partners to him in that work. Um, but Daniel was really the visionary there. He, he also was um, a, a very um, important affiliate of this organization called the Club of Rome, which really was the entity that founded the modern environmental movement. Uh, they wrote a book called Earth for All that um, really set the pace for so much of what uh, we understand as climate change studies and, and um, the awareness around how the climate was changing. Um, those come back to this, the consensus of this, it's like 100 plus top scientists in the world that came together to form this, this entity. So we took the discipline uh, from that group um, and the methodology. We took Daniel's incredible data set and his vision to architect this. Um, and then we brought AI experts um, to help support that effort. So folks over at AppTech, um, who've been at this for 30 years, they helped train the model and they also provided uh, critical tools uh, to help fine tune the model and also translate data uh, from other languages into a common language that then we use to train the model. So to give you a sense, you're kind of keeping the score here, there's dozens of people that have been involved in this and when you start to think about that type of coordination, that's actually what most LLMs are. They're not just one person doing work. They're, they're dozens, if not hundreds of people that have contributed towards something. 
if you take a look at the originators of the data, you know, now we're talking about potentially like millions of contributors, right? Because we're mm, talking yeah. about authors of you know scientific articles or you know websites, etc. Um, so, in any event, that is an important reminder that all LLM work, all AI work, is actually collaborative. And so that's where the governance comes in. That's where our tools come in, is that they help establish things like attribution, like who contributed what. Um, they set some rules around how we're all going to decide to curate information, uh, to decide on what the benchmarks are for performance, when is something biased, et cetera. The, these are things that we created a framework to collaboratively govern something. And, and in fact, um, little known fact, the, um, the model is actually owned by a DAO. Um, we called oh, it wow. the yeah. We called it the endowment <laughs> for climate intelligence. So we hid DAO in the word just, <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, and that you know it's a reflection of the reality of what what this is. It's a collective project. So hopefully that answers a little bit around like what you know the vision was for this is for a bunch of really committed and passionate and talented people here to set a vision of of how we can all come together to aggregate high quality information to address this this problem that's ubiquitous and global. I'd love to hear your thoughts a bit more on uh, on this, this question of AI governance, which I find very quite interesting. The, the last episode that we did here was actually uh, with Caitlin from Falcon Foundation talking about like blockchain governance. And, uh, you know, it, it just as I was listening to you talk there, I was thinking like blockchain governance is like difficult enough, but, you know, AI governance seems like kind of a whole different component, right? Um, you know, just I would love your kind of thoughts on I mean, we're obviously like very early stages as far as, you know, governance of the of like open source LLMs, right? This, there's, there's definitely not like a, 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 a fixed sort of consensus around how this is done or whatnot. But would love your thinking on, uh, you know, how are you guys approaching this? And uh, like what lessons can we maybe extrapolate from what we've learned with like Web3 governance over the years? So, so we're in a really weird time because the most valuable model that's out there is ChatGPT. If you look at just the valuation. And it was originally owned by a nonprofit. It's in the profit process of moving to become a for benefit corporation. And so, actually, this idea of having AI governed in, in a new way by a new type of corporate entity is, is actually the big, one of the big experiments that we're undergoing right now. And it has a been smooth, right? As as you mentioned, like Sam Alman got removed and then he got added back. Why is that? Well, there's complicated governance questions going on there, right? Um, did he follow the rules? Did he not? Like who who could hold him accountable? Well, the board kind of did, but not completely. Um, so all the money in the world, apparently, you know, can't necessarily create good governance um, right off the bat, right? Um, but does that mean that we shouldn't do this? Like, absolutely not. And, and I think that Web3 you know, has shown that these types of opportunities for collective governance is really important. And that we, as we innovate, we're not just innovating on the technical level, we're also innovating on, on the level of governance. And I, and I don't think it's been, uh, it's not finished, but I think we've made a lot of progress in Web3. And I think we can bring a lot of those lessons over to AI. Um, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, the first is that you know previously it was really difficult to do large scale governance. So to be able to reach a lot of people, get their votes, maybe pay them if they are due some form of profit or participation, um, and that was because you know, the the conventional systems out there, which is like checks and paper uh, forms of uh, record keeping um, and transmission of, of money, et cetera, were, were just simply you know unviable to do some form of large-scale fractional ownership. Um, and blockchains have shown that you, you can do this actually really successfully. Now, it doesn't solve all the human problems around you know, how we come together as coalitions and how we agree on things, but we have a chance of hearing people's voices and being able to create proper attribution and compensation. So that we shouldn't take for granted, first and foremost. Um, we have new tools. And then the second question is whether or not you believe that the proper way to govern is that everyone that owns something is also entitled to like an equal vote. And there, I would argue that's not necessarily what we want. 
I think this, there's kind of a, it's almost like a, a kind of a false debate, right? Because what you really want is you want experts making the very best decision for an organization. And you want the people that are stakeholders in that organization to be in a position to appoint and to remove those types of experts. I think that that's a fair assumption, right? You want strong leaders that are experts in managing a business, right? That's a that's an okay thing. I think we can all agree that that's that's not, you know, need to have um, decentralized leadership necessarily in order to have something be effective or fair, right? We can have representatives do that work. So, um, long way to answer this, which is that I think we have a long journey ahead, but also this. Imagine if if you were to ask people like, you know, what were the what would be the possibilities around creating voice in AI? If you have even asked them this twenty years ago, they would have said it'd be nearly impossible to do what we know that we can do in an instant today in Web three. So, um, so I remain hopeful that we can continue to innovate. And kind of on that same point, uh, I'd like to maybe shift gears slightly to a talk you did recently at the the Web3 Summit, the Polkadot Summit in Berlin. I think it was maybe back in August. And you made some really interesting, uh, perhaps heterodox observations about this intersection of AI and Web3, uh, both the values as well as the primitives. And I was hoping you could maybe unpack some of those here for us in our, our last couple minutes, uh, particularly around to around this idea that, that Web3 values are really like what is going to like we need these Web three values to make AI work in an equitable manner, like for the world, essentially. Yeah, um, you know, there's this talk now, and it's it's kind of like a fashionable sort of topic in a way to address this theme, as investors might call it, around AI and crypto. And I. I think it's funny because it's. I, I just don't view these things as distinct. I actually think of AI as really the the most profound expression of the web, because what it is is a very efficient compression of the world's knowledge into an interactive tool that you can ask it any question and it can basically extract in a very efficient way, um, statistically speaking, the right predictive the prediction of what your answer should be based on the world's knowledge in, in other words this is just another interface for the web so i might google something to like search and find a piece of information or in this case i might just ask chat, chat gpt but for the most part like it's actually really the same sort of thing what's interesting is that now with that first chapter essentially on its way and and, and a mainstream tool we're getting into the next chapter where the world's knowledge is not just something that I can recall with some form of inference through, let's say, a question. The next chapter involves agentic workflows, where you have an AI model talking to another AI model or two agents, AI agents, interacting with each other in semi-autonomous and then ultimately autonomous ways. And so they are using the world's information to now start to create layers and layers and layers and layers of, of new forms of um, answers and, um, and new tools. Again, this is just the next version of the web. So if that's the case, that means all of us in Web3, we're already part of the AI story. And what are the types of things that we can bring? Um, first, we can bring massive amounts of compute. Web3 has shown we know how to do this better than anyone. And you don't need <laughs> right a trillion dollar plus market cap in order to do it. We've, we've found ways of spinning up decentralized networks of compute that have that rival um, what any major uh, cloud service provider has today. Um, the second thing is is data. like we we have the ability to, um, as you know, through the Falcon ecosystem and others have shown that, you know, people are willing to come together to aggregate information and aggregate data. So we can bring that to the table. And, and finally, we have ideas around governance and attribution that are really powerful that, that, you know, can help us form the type of communities that we really want to advance AI. So um, I think what holds most people back 
in the Web3 community is a reasonable fear about AI. It's, I think we need to be very careful because this, it, there, are, there are dangers with the tool. So I understand that red, reticence. The other thing is that um, it's been left to experts, namely a lot of like PhDs run around and they write the research papers on AI. And so it just seems impenetrable in some, some respects. Um, and, the, and I think that that is actually changing. And I think people are finding that humans have a lot to do with this, not just PhDs who are kind of similar. <laughs> um, so I think the democratization of AI is well underway. And I think more people from Web3 will get in there. Um, and finally, I think, you know, I'll just leave you with this, you know, I guess some sadness on, on my part. And, and then maybe I'll turn that into something hopeful, which is that um, I think people are worried that the, the game's over. That mm. in order to really have awesome AI that you know does what we want it to do, um, that already there's been a, such a massive consolidation you know, with big tech offering the very best AI tools right now, having access to the best compute, et cetera, that maybe it's too late. And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you, there's nothing could, that could be farther from the truth. Um, we, we will look back at this kind of brick cell phone era of AI and kind of laugh at the power of these models, right? Like they're, they're, they're just simply just the, the very beginning of, of what's to come. And um, so hopefully, you know, the mobilization of compute, talent, resources, capital, et cetera, that, can, that we know can come from Web3 um, will answer this call uh, to realize that this is, this is actually ours, our chapter to write. Yeah, I'll, I'll confess that I've also fallen into this sort of AI, you know, doomerism trap of of just you see the headlines and it's like, oh, like how are we going to compete against all these big techs that are just hoovering everything up? And Sam Altman's getting more powerful, and he's turning his nonprofit into a for profit now, and he's and he's going to he's easily going to be like the richest man in the world here pretty soon. And they're playing the regulatory capture game, and they're going to kick away the ladder, and it's like, how is anybody going to can really compete with that? But I think so. It is easy to fall into that trap. Uh, but I think on the other hand, the open source and Web3 web movements of the last really 10, 20, 30 years have shown us that just this, this ability to like this swarm of open source innovation uh, has the ability to compete with the centralized giants. Right. It's, it's really a question of it's like, in a, it, you know, are you going to choose like the fleet of the drone, the drone swarm, like the drone, uh, drone airplane army? Or are you going to choose like the B-15 bomber? It's like, well, the drone swarm is going to win every time at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's kind of the superpower that the open source community brings. And um, really, that's what, what folks like you, Jonathan, are really, really putting into action and, and really, really kind of leading the charge on, which is quite commendable. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I do think that, like, it is important to just not fall into this trap of, like, like you said, just, just thinking that we've already lost the game. It's like, we, like we, don't, we, we were just realizing the game is starting and we already feel like we lost. It's like the first quarter and totally. we're already like, all right, let's just put in the back, put in the reserves, you know, like it's, this one's <laughs> like this one's, this one's gone. Um, so I think it's important to keep, you know, keep our head in the game and like really keep focusing and keep, and keep moving ahead on these, on these principles. Um, anyway, just wrapping up here, you know, just in terms of like roadmap for you guys at Equity Lab, Climate GPT, you know, next six, 12 months, what should we be expecting to see? Like, what are you guys looking to, to accomplish here? So we're really excited about verifiable compute. And you'll see some announcements from us later this quarter on some breakthroughs that we've had uh, with offering new cryptographic proofs that help establish exactly what computation has happened. So, you know, what data is loaded into a processor, what has actually been processed, and then finally the output being genuine. Um, we have things that we've done with a variety of different partners and, and that roadmap will unfold. It's going to be really exciting. We've got a whole year's worth of activity there that spans a variety of different uh, verifiable compute methods from hardware all the way to ZK and, and consensus-based approaches. So we're, we're really pumped about that. It's a nice complement to the work around verifiable storage that we've been hard at work at some time and the addition of um, verifiable governance which um, is some new standards that we've been working on with the w3c and, and others to help sharpen um, these opportunities for for people really to become stakeholders and uh, be able to express and have binding governance around uh, ai um, that's 
really what we exist to do. And um, we hope to introduce some of those open source standards um, and get them adopted by a, a variety of different applications, Climate GPT being the first, uh, which is a nonprofit DAO-based endeavor, um, but also um, stretching into enterprise and beyond. Very cool. Well, Jonathan, really appreciate your time today. I uh, really appreciate the work you're doing. Very inspiring, very intriguing. And uh, I love how this all is just kind of building on the, the, the story of Filecoin and, and building on the Filecoin ecosystem, what we've accomplished here. And uh, I think you really like, you know, you, you carry the values of this ecosystem really well. You're kind of the, you know, the one of the, the, the people out there who's like really like the face of this and um, really can articulate things so well. And uh, <laughs> Well, in a good way, right? Uh, but like, so I appreciate all the work you're doing. Uh, it's really inspiring to see. And, you know, I just want to say thank you on behalf of the ecosystem uh, for all the work you're doing. And uh, thank you for your time here today as well. So where can folks go if they want to learn more about what you're working on or just get in touch with you in general? EquityLab.io. And you'll see that website expand with a lot more information. Um, and please be in touch. We've got a lot of things that we can contribute, open, closed source AI, what have you. We're, we're here to help. Um, and thanks, Aaron, for having me on with this, um, the mission of the F50W and um, all the great things that you guys stand for at the foundation and with the protocol. Um, you know, those we're, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants here like that have spent a lot of time figuring out in this community really difficult questions. Um, should say that you guys were early in many respects. Like if you kind of roll back the tape to what uh, this community was saying would happen and should happen with... Um, the, the future of the web. I, I think now a lot of that is is coming to pass. So um, yeah, we're, we're really excited to keep engaging and to contribute however best we can. Awesome. Well, Jonathan, thanks again for your time and thanks everyone for watching and we'll see you next time on DWeb Decoded.